This is America's first greatest generation. People from all walks of life who experienced the Revolutionary War and then lived into the age of photography in the 1840s and 1850s. In the early 1800s, the United States government created a new set of legislation, pension acts, meant to guarantee a monthly payment to aging veterans of the Revolutionary War. But many of these old soldiers had no evidence of their service. So instead, they went to their local courthouses and magistrates and recorded detailed oral memoirs of their Revolutionary War service. Over 80,000 applied for pensions, and this amazing trove, the nation's first veterans oral history project, sat largely unutilized in federal archives for over a century. The museum's pension project pairs those pension memoirs with today's generation of veterans, asking veterans to reflect on similarities and differences between their service and that of people over two centuries ago. Pension of Ezekiel Ayers, September 4th, 1832. As soon as we heard that war was declared, we proceeded at Hackettstown to choose officers for our company. When Samuel Landon was chosen our captain, Edward Bowman, lieutenant, and I was chosen ensign was sent for our commissions and soon received them from Governor Livingston, being the first officers chosen in that neighborhood after independence was proclaimed. I'm Adam Strauss. I served as an infantry officer in the Marine Corps from 2017 to 2021. I'm going to be reading from Ezekiel Ayers' Revolutionary War Pension. In this document, he's recollecting his experiences during the war to support his application for a pension. Ayers was one of tens of thousands of veterans who applied for pensions in the 1800s, creating a large oral history archive documenting their experiences. Ezekiel Ayers from like Northwest Jersey was a junior officer in a militia outfit during the Revolutionary War. Um, he participated in a couple kind of small scale campaigns, mostly harassing. Early in the war, he interacted briefly with the British peace delegation that was come over to try to head off the Revolutionary War, which is I think just like a cool moment of history to have been present for. I mean, obviously, spoiler alert, didn't work. Um, <laughs> yeah, and then after the war, he lost his commissioning documents and basically everything he had from that era. And so he's applying for this pension and this oral history is his like only proof of ever having been in. This was in the year 1776. We proceeded immediately to class our company and to make a draft among them. The lot fell upon me among the officers to go, and I marched with our part of the company and joined our captain, whose name was John Vlett, at Miller's Tavern near Squires Point in the said county of Sussex. One Peppinger was our lieutenant. We then marched through Black River, Peapack, and Pluckham and Quibbletown to Amboy, and was there with Colonel DeMunn, who went with us from Greenwich in Sussex County. I was well acquainted with him, put my clothes in the chest with him. We had a full company of 75 men and a baggage wagon with us. While at Amboy, I recollected the English ambassadors arrived there and I had the command and kept them until the higher officers arrived and bandaged their eyes and led them blindfolded up to town. So when people ask about my deployment experience, uh, as I think anyone who's deployed gets asked, uh, the first feeling I think is just frustration at the way that words fail to distill any experience, but certainly one that all encompassing into words. And I had a very mild deployment. I never heard a shot fired in anger. The primary emotion I experienced during my time was boredom with frustration being a close second. Sometimes you might be called on to stay up all night as a quick reaction force for a special operations unit that's out conducting uh, operations somewhere in Helmand. Spend an unbelievable amount of time standing post, right up in a guard tower near the FOB, scanning the horizon for something, someone. I understood their object was to make peace in case war and independence had not been proclaimed. I continued there a month and returned home, I think in the month of August. In the fall of the same year, I was called out again and went out as ensign under the same captain and lieutenant, Landon and Bowman. We marched to Elizabethtown and continued there one month under Colonel Ford and General Dickerson. 
During this time, we several times crossed the island with a part of our company to capture the British picket guard. We never took any men, but two or three times drove them off and took their baggage. So I, I never saw combat during my time in the Marine Corps. And I think that if you had told 18 year old me getting ready to join the RDC, that was my future. I think that kid would have been pretty bitterly disappointed because to him, that was at the core of this thing. And certainly in a lot of military media, whether those are movies, works of fiction, memoir, whatever the case is, the real inflection point, right, when one goes from boy to man, is basically, you know, hearing a bullet crack overhead for the first time and returning fire. On the back end of my experience, I think I can just simply say that I'm proud that it, everything was asked of me. I think I'm prouder still that all my Marines came home, and that to me is more valuable than anything else in the world. End of story. Even so, I think that just the experience of truly being at the edge of the American empire was very eye-opening. I do feel like I learned a lot more about America on my deployment than I did about either Afghanistan or Iraq. We had a skirmish with them at Springfield. The commanding officer gave me the command of some men, about 250, as our captain and lieutenant had come home on furlough, and ordered me to go down the Turkey Road to Springfield and to wait where the road until another company came the other road. This we did, and it was at night, I think between eight and nine o'clock, when we met and formed to carry on the street firing. Captain Kirkendall was in the front company and was wounded in the first fire and had two of his fingers shot off. I came in the next division and fired and wheeled to make room for the next company, which was our orders. We then had to retreat, but wheeled three times and attacked them again and then retreated to Chatham. We had a great many wounded and several killed. In the spring following, I was out again one month under the same officers at Boundbrook and there had a skirmish with the British with our artillery. We lost none of our men and did not get at it with the small arms. We were laying close by to protect the artillery. We feared there were several of their artillery and light horse killed. Towards the end of my deployment, once we began our retrograde from country, as an officer, I was the lucky one who got to handle a lot of accountability for gear, ammunition, things flowing out of country. As a side note, as someone who spent, say, wasted an unbelievable amount of time accounting for, you know, in, you know, spare barrels for every 50 cal and things of that nature, seeing the billions of dollars of gear we left behind when we finally did leave Afghanistan adds a level of kind of cruel irony. And also it really does salt the wound, seeing pictures of people in the Taliban walking around. It's like, oh, that's an American Kevlar. That's an American flak. That's an American M4. Like that is all of our gear that they're now gonna to use to oppress their own people. After the termination of the war, I took but little care of my commission and rather expect it was burnt with a great many other of my papers and I have no other documentary evidence of my service.